everybody. I'm Monique McLaughlin from Cairo 7, and I cannot begin to tell you what an honor it is and a salve for my soul to join you for Seattle College's 48th celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It is easy to feel lost in these dark times, and more than ever, Dr. King's legacy can serve really as a North Star. This is when I would normally be looking at your smiling faces and encouraging you to take your seats. Of course, this year is very different. You may even have your slippers on this time, but you'll still be tapping your feet. Mount Zion doesn't need to worry about Danelle Damon and Greater Works blowing the roof off this year, but I can't protect your computer speakers, so let's get this started. Hello, Seattle, Washington. This is Danelle Damon. This is Greater Works. We are excited to once again be with you on this Martin Luther King celebration. We realize that we're not together in the building of Mount Zion, where we fellowship every year, but we would not let social distancing stop us from enjoying this momentous occasion with you that we've been apart for over 15 years. Thank everyone for inviting us. We hope that these songs minister to your heart. I would like to give homage to Seattle Colleges, even the, Dr. Late, the late Dr. Samuel McKinney, who's been with us all the way through these situations. We're grateful to be a part, and we will see you next year. Have a blessed day, and I hope these songs minister to your heart.
Good rising. May your day be well, may your night be well, and all the moments in between, may your day and your night be well. Welcome to our 48th annual community celebration of beloved ancestor, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Welcome. My name is Dr. Valerie Hunt, and I am the daughter of Murdy Hunt and beloved ancestor, Richard Hunt. And I get the pleasure of serving as Associate Vice President of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at my beloved campus, Seattle Central College. And we are so delighted to have you here today. Let's get going. Greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome to the 48th Annual Community Celebration of MLK. My name is DeAndre Fisher. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I get the honor and the privilege to serve as Associate Vice President for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at North Seattle College, but I have to bring in the EDI beloved team at North Seattle College who really does the work alongside with me. Thank you for all the work that you've done and continue to do and so excited to be here. Hello, welcome. My name is Betsy Hasegawa. I use she, her, and hers pronouns, and I'm Ainu in Japanese heritages. And I have the honor and privilege of serving as Associate Vice President for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at South Seattle College. Um, I'm very pleased to be here, to be part of this event, to be part of this community, and um, welcome. Gather with me as we do our land acknowledgement. Our land acknowledgement reads as follows. Today, we recognize and honor the original occupants and stewards of the land where we're gathering virtually. Many of us join this meeting and this event from lands from the traditional home of the Coast Salish people, the traditional home of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Suquamish, Talea, and Muckleshoot nations. Today, we honor the survival, the force, assimilation, and the resiliency and creativity of Native peoples, past, present, and future. We encourage you all as participants to consider your responsibility to the people and the land, both here and elsewhere, and stand in solidarity with our Native, Indigenous, and First Nations people and their sovereignty, cultural heritage, and lives. Thank you.
Well, thank you again to Danell Damon and Greater Works. Let's continue to lift every voice, especially those of the leaders of equity, diversity, and inclusion who just set the stage for today's program. Your work is essential. Your voices build our community, and education is the foundation. EDI are the pillars. Now, understanding our history is essential to true understanding. And boy, are we in the middle of living history. I don't need to talk about all of our challenges. We've all felt them, we've suffered from them, and persevered in our own ways, though not always on our own terms. I'll admit to kind of stewing in some doom here. I thought, just get us through 2020. And there was hope on a number of fronts. And then in this new year, this new dawn, last Wednesday happened. Whenever I used to think of our nation's capital, I would think of the images and the scene that framed Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, the profound inspiration. But the image of that dream was eclipsed by a nightmare. And then I got the email from Barbara Childs of Seattle Colleges asking me if I could do this. Yes, yes, I need to be among all of you. I can't see the whites of your eyes, but I can feel the heat of your energy and your optimism and your purpose. And it reminds me, there is a lot of work to do, and it can be done. Now consider this statement, made about an imperfect election and what should happen in the aftermath. This is it. We are a mighty nation because we embedded in our national experiment the chance to fix what is broken, to call out what has faltered, to demand fairness where it can be found, which is why on election night I declared that our fight to count every vote is not about me, it is about us. It's about the democracy we share and our responsibility to preserve our way of life, our democracy, because voting is a right and not a privilege. Now, needless to say, those eloquent words are not from anyone objecting to the free and fair election this past November. That was Stacey Abrams. She had genuine grievances about the election she lost. Actual evidence that people had been purged from the voting rolls when she ran for Georgia governor in 2018. And when someone else was declared the victor, she called others to action and the response swelled not calling others to violence, but to education, to registration. She got hundreds of thousands of people to register to vote in her state. And now Georgia has elected two new senators. That African-American woman is one of the biggest reasons that Deep South State is sending a Jewish man to the Senate, along with Reverend Raphael Warnock, a man who preaches from the very pulpit Dr. King did at Ebenezer Baptist Church. In these crooked times, that is the straight line you can draw from Dr. King to the hope that we have today. It doesn't have to be a nightmare. That is the dream, and it still lives among all of us right now. We just have to keep working. And it is my pleasure to recognize people who have rolled up their sleeves, committed to doing the work in education. The leaders of Seattle Colleges, from the Board of Directors, Board Chair Steve Hill, Vice Chair Rosa Peralta, Teresita Badayola, Louise Ch Chernin and Robert Williams. Also the college presidents, Dr. Shamine Crawford, Dr. Sheila Edwards Lang and Dr. Rosie Ramondo Cherensap. This year we also invited our community and local leaders to contribute a video message as part of today's celebration. And you can find them at Seattle College's website. That's seattlecolleges.edu slash MLK. But you don't have to go anywhere to hear from this leader. Seattle College's Chancellor, Dr. Sean Pan. Good afternoon, students, faculty, staff, and friends. Thank you for joining us in this traditional celebration. It is so nice to have you with us again. You've become part of the Seattle Colleges family, now officially invited to all the barbecues. I want to first acknowledge Mount Zion Baptist Church. Seattle Colleges have been celebrating Dr. Martin Luther King's events for over almost 50 years. And this is the 35th year for us in partnership with Mount Zion Baptist Church. Although we are not together in person today, we are together in spirit in our shared pursuit of Dr. Martin Luther King's dream. And it's that spirit and his vision that has kept us marching with determination and hope, even in the darkest times for so long. I want to also thank our employees, students, communities, 
and everyone associated with the program. I've only been here for five years, but in that short time, I've come to know and appreciate the importance of this day and what we're here to do and what we're here to accomplish. I stand here today with a sense of pride and joy. In a recent note I sent to my Seattle College's colleagues, I spoke about the resilience and grit we've all shown over the past year. The pandemic has been so tough on all of us, but especially for the black faculty staff students, physically, mentally, financially, and spiritually. The pain, the suffering, and the trauma experienced by our BIPOC community are deep, lasting, and devastating. I'm encouraged, however, that we are all here, standing, pressing on, moving forward, and so are our students. Proof of this was recently on full display when the Seattle Times wrote extensively about our students and the Seattle Promise program. Even in an unprecedented global pandemic, we're fulfilling our duty as educators, giving students the stability they need to keep their goals in focus and carry on. So please indulge me a moment while I sing the praises of the city of Seattle, Seattle Public Schools, and all the faculty, staff, students, and employees at the Seattle College District for their hard work building a model program for our state and nation. Like you, I saw the underbelly of our nation on full display last week. The images and videos of January 6 events were frightening and unsettling. America and the whole world saw hate symbols displayed in the US Capitol. We witnessed members of the white supremacist and extremist groups, including the Proud Boys and other hate groups with arms, trampled on the most sacred, most precious value, the American democracy. And this was happening when another 3,865 some Americans were dying from COVID-19 virus. While these images are fresh and vivid in front of our eyes, I cannot help asking, how do we interpret process what has happened individually and collectively? What would Dr. King say if he were alive today? In this moment of great national reckoning, an astute statement by Mr. Darren Walker president of the Ford Foundation, really helped me to understand the situation. He wrote, democracy is the greatest threat to white supremacy. And then we learned that the state of Georgia elect the state's first black senator and a Jewish senator. All of this were orchestrated by Stacey Abrams, a black woman who lost her race for governorship in 2018. How about that? And Mr. Walker, the president of the Ford Foundation, also wrote about drawing hope from this very difficult, fragile moments of American democracy. And I quote, I'm hopeful because from our founding contradiction, we have emerged a freer, fairer nation all too slowly, all too unevenly, all too imperfectly, and at a far too high a cost, we, the people, have struggled to root out the strand of white supremacy in our nation's DNA. It is with this kind of optimism and hope that we can move forward with realizing Dr. King's vision of building a beloved community. You'll hear us talk about building a beloved community in the future. It will serve as a guidepost for our internal, external work for the coming years. For us educators, we're going to, and we need to do our part. Specifically, this means doing our part in ensuring every student who come to one of our colleges receive quality education and support to complete a degree or credential. This means 
resolutely oppose ideas and groups that promote hatred and violence. It means working hard at eliminating racism, homophobia, xenophobia, and any other forms of hatred, both in and outside the classroom. This means including the teachings of Dr. King and other ethnically, culturally relevant materials in our programs, in our curriculum. This means doing our part in offering learning and training program that truly leads to living wage jobs for BIPOC women, LGBT students right here in Seattle. This means leaving Seattle College's values of equity, diversity, inclusion, and community. And this means delivering the promise of preparing students for success in life and work as Seattle College's mission requires. Let me end my remarks by quoting Dr. King. He wrote in 1966, our goal is to create a beloved community and this will require a qualitative change in our souls as well as quantitative change in our lives. Thank you. Come on, put your hands together, everybody. Come on. God is great and greatly to be praised.
And I'd like to acknowledge the leadership and vision of another special individual, the late Reverend Dr. Samuel B. McKinney. For the young folks out there who didn't get the great chance to know him, you can still feel his influence even if you don't realize it. He was a giant among leaders in the Northwest. He helped launch Seattle's first black-owned bank after local banks restricted loans to African Americans. He served as an original member of the Seattle Human Rights Commission, which successfully advocated for passage of Seattle's first Fair Housing Act. In the 1960s, he took part in civil rights demonstrations in Seattle, Alabama, and Washington, D.C., and he convinced his college classmate, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., to come to Seattle in 1961. That was Dr. King's only visit to the city. Now, we pulled a video clip of the late Reverend Dr. McKinney, recorded shortly before his passing and sharing a memory of his friend, Dr. King. Good afternoon. I regret that I'm not able to be with you in person, but I'm certainly with you in spirit and honor the occasion which brings us together, that of honoring the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who touched and transformed all of our lives for good. And it's grand that the community colleges are giving leadership in this regard. And for years, Mount Zion has been the place, the venue, where this recognition of his birthday has taken place. I knew him for many years. In fact, I met him before we went to college. His father and my father were both pastors of sizable churches in their respective communities, Atlanta and Cleveland, Ohio. And having to go to these meetings, both of us were looking for some relief from what we thought was excessive hot air, and escape us uh, from that. So when September 1944, I enrolled in Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, which was also <clears throat> my father's alma mater. I saw him again, and we both recognized each other. Yeah, I knew him before he became famous. I knew him, according to some people, when he was infamous. But he did the right thing at the right time for the right reason. Well, this is an event that honors Dr. King and what he stood for and what he did and what became his mission, that of speaking for justice, civil rights, and the right thing. Some people now are so heaven bound they're not any earthly good. And he kept many people's feet anchored. So how special is it to hear Reverend Dr. Samuel B. McKinney's voice again and to realize his advice and wisdom 
are timeless. Seattle College has created a scholarship in Reverend McKinney's name. In his name, it hopes to broaden his deep commitment to social justice and equality and to spread his faith. And he would be proud of this year's McKinney Scholar. Betty Andrews earned an associate degree at South Seattle College, and now she's moving on to a bachelor's in hospitality management. And she has plans for a nonprofit to help repair our community after COVID. Dr. Betsy Hasegawa learned more about her ambitious plans. My name is Betty Andrews, and I've been going to South Seattle College, and I've uh, achieved my AA. And now I'm also yeah. going for my uh, BA in hospitality management. So Ms. Betty, I am so proud of you. Congratulations. It's just such an honor to get to, to recognize and celebrate you and the work you've been doing and the work that you will be doing. And you know what a, what a difference I know that you have been and, and will continue to make in the world. So, so thank you so much for, um, you know, I'm gonna say, Thank you for, for choosing South Seattle to be part of, of your, your journey. Uh, I, I decided to come back to college because, uh, you know, I have plans to try and help the communities out and uh, have a, get a nonprofit organization. And I think that would uh, service the community well. And what would you like your nonprofit, what's the, gonna be the focus of your nonprofit? Uh, rebuilding communities after COVID. Well, I, I thank you so much for the way that you've been really um, selflessly and humbly serving the community.
Welcome to our 48th annual community celebration. We are in a Sankofa moment. Sankofa is a key Swahili proverb that means, it is good to go back to fetch what would be lost. In this Sankofa moment, we go back to the wellspring of Dr. King's insight and hope, his urging us to build up the beloved community. In his visioning, he begins with the end in mind. The end is reconciliation. The end is redemption. The end is the creation of the beloved community. It is this type of spirit and this type of love that can transform opponents into friends. It is this type of understanding goodwill that will transform the deep gloom of the old age and to the exuberant gladness of the new age. It is this love which will bring about miracles in the hearts of men. We hold on to his words in the wake of the global pandemic, coronavirus 19, and his horrifying ravages on communities of color. For Dr. King, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and inhumane. Indeed, the global pandemic has shocked the nation with stark realities of deaths many times higher for BIPOC communities than for white communities. We can clearly see the need for health activism. How can Dr. King's vision of the beloved community help us with realizing health activism? I will address this with three questions. What is the beloved community? What is needed to build it? And how can we take part? The beloved community is less to be explained and more to be lived out. For fellow visionary, Dr. Vincent Harding, it is understanding that we are all citizens of a country that does not yet exist, but badly needs to exist. A country that cares about its children and about its elders, about itself, and about the world, about what the earth needs as well as what individual people need. What is needed to build up the beloved community? Seeing with a heart of compassion, seeing what we don't want to see, but must. Beloved US Poet Laureate Joy Hardrow tells us, let us not shame our eyes for seeing. Instead, thank them for their bravery. An example of that acting after seeing is King County Public Health Department's declaring racism a public health crisis in King County. How do we take part? Now in this Sankofa moment, we can dedicate our energies to practicing health activism. At Seattle Colleges, we want to build up what we are already doing to support the financial, creative, spiritual and emotional wellness of everyone in our beloved community. We hope our program inspires you to take part in building up the beloved community as envisioned by Reverend Dr. Samuel McKinney and Dr. King. Thank you for listening and may you be well. 
Well, Dr. Hunt, we are so fortunate to have you in our beloved community. Thank you so much. And now I have the pleasure of introducing someone else doing vital work in our city and our county. Matias Valenzuela is the Director of Equity and Community Partnerships for Public Health Seattle King County. Now for the COVID-19 response, he's been leading community mitigation and recovery. He's also been co-leading work for the county on the declaration of racism as a public health crisis since June of 2020. Now, before that, he founded and directed the Office of Equity and Social Justice in King County, spearheading a countywide effort to address the root causes of inequities, especially racism, working with all county agencies and the community. Matias has worked at King County for more than 20 years, including as a lead for equity and social justice at its inception in 2008. And in his career, he was a print and broadcast journalist in the U.S. and abroad. He's been a Fulbright professor in Nicaragua. He is an affiliate assistant professor at the University of Washington School of Public Health and Community Medicine, and he currently serves on numerous local and national boards and advisory groups. Mr. Matias Valenzuela. Thank you for inviting me today and for being here. It's an honor to be with you in a county, King County, that is named after Dr. Martin Luther King. But that has not always been the case. Of course, these were tribal lands, and with the coming of the United States for many decades, our county was named after Rufus King. Rufus King was the founding father of the United States, who helped frame the Constitution, a senator, and a diplomat, and he ran unsuccessfully for vice president and for president in the early 19th century. Also, many folks don't know this, he was a slave owner. And that's who our county, King County, was named after. Today, though, I can proudly say that we are all sitting or standing in Martin Luther King Jr. County. This change of our namesake took li literally decades, and it was the work of many at the state and local level. But I have to acknowledge the big role of Black leaders, including our former council member, Larry Gossett, in making this change. I myself feel honored to work in the area of racial equity and health in a county now named after Dr. Martin Luther King that has been leading this work nationally. But our work has so much farther to go. Dr. King said, when we look at a modern man, we have to face the fact that modern man suffers from a kind of poverty of the spirit, which stands in glaring contrast with a scientific and technological abundance. We've learned to fly the air as birds We've learned to swim the seas as fish, yet we haven't learned to walk the earth as brothers and sisters. I look at our region and I am amazed at the wealth, the advancement, the industries here. We have some of the most powerful and wealthy people and companies in the world and some of the largest inequities in our country. In our country and our county, race and place matter. In King County, our white populations are among the wealthiest and healthiest in the nation, if not the world. Yet many of our communities of color have similar outcomes to communities of color in other parts of the country. So in fact, what we have are inequities and gaps that are greater than other parts of the country. It's shocking and it's troubling that in our county, men, for example, face an 18 year life expectancy gap in, in, depending on where you live between 68 years of age, life expectancy to 86 years of age, whether you're a resident of Mercer Island or Bellevue, or you live in Auburn or areas of South King County. These geographic differences are racialized since this reflects the racial patterns or also could be called current racial segregation that exists in our region. And we see these outcomes by race and place play out in all conditions and diseases. Right now, we are all thinking about the pandemic and COVID-19. With COVID-19, Black, Latinx, Pacific Islander communities are two to five times more likely to be infected than whites. Let me say that again, two to five times more likely. And this is not due to individual choice and behaviors under one's control. There are deep rooted inequities in our structures and our systems that determine who has access to the social determinants of a health. This is good food, good jobs, housing, education. For COVID-19, we have to ask who is an essential worker? Who is working in grocery stores, transit, factories, warehouses? Who 
are the people living in multi-generational households who are much more likely to be infected. These are our communities of color. And white individuals and families are much more likely to have the luxury, because it is a luxury to be able to telecommute and stay safe at home. The start of this year has been challenging on top of the very challenging 2020, but our communities of color, especially our black and indigenous communities are extremely resilient. I won't get into the details of the recent violence and the storming of institutions and the mob and the other Washington where we saw the ugliness of white supremacy. Folks of color were not surprised either by the acts themselves or the lack of response by police. This is because today's actions and outcomes are steeped in history. But last June, we at King County, both our director of public health and our county executive made an important announcement by declaring racism a public health crisis. With this, we acknowledge that we have two crises at the moment, both racism and COVID-19. And one of these was already with us. Though I'm proud that King County has declared racism a public health crisis, it is also important for us as government to ask some hard questions. Why have we put so much attention, effort, and resources into COVID-19 and we haven't responded to the crisis of racism with the same level of vigor? Just think, not just locally, but the federal level, how much money and finance has gone into the COVID crisis. Just earlier this month, $1 trillion and the incoming president has promised, promised much more. Also, let's ask what role have we as institutions and individuals played in perpetuating the injustices that we have today? And why did it take a dizzying amount and number of stories and imaging, uh, images of killings of black people to get us to the state of declaring racism a public health crisis? It took us a long time to do this. We declared racism a public health crisis in June when we were collectively sickened by the images of violence on black bodies seen on TV and social media on a daily basis. But in addition to these horrific acts of violence in a more quiet yet no less sinister way, we live in a system that is literally killing and suffocating black and brown lives every single day through taking away years of life due to chronic disease, burying families in debt due to predatory lending practices and housing policies, and taking away the right to life and health for large portions of our population when black and brown people and families do not have access to the healthy environments and neighborhoods, we all need to thrive. We must also recognize that historically and currently King County government has been complicit and we all and all the institutions, including in education and others have to be complicit about understand or call out how complicit we are in maintaining and perpetuating structural racism. And as institutions, we must be vital players in dismantling these oppressive systems. That's what these declarations mean. When we declared racism public health crisis last year, we as King County and public health made some important, important commitments. We said we will share power, resources, and work with community-defined problems using community-driven solutions co-created by people most negatively impacted by racism. We committed to convening other jurisdictions and agencies across sectors and to establish shared measurable accountability measures. Community leaders and organizations will be provided with resources to co-create solutions. We made those commitments because we know that together we can lay the foundation for a better, stronger community. Where we started putting uh, our money where our mouth is and also made significant down payments. At King County, we produced an anti-racism biennial budget for 21-22 and a policy agenda. As part of this budget and policy agenda, we made it clear we're going to transform the way our county views and treats public safety and divesting from the old systems and reinvest in Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities who have been most harmed by systems rooted in oppression. So in this current budget and policies, we made uh, investments and policies that are diverting us from uh, incarcerating and investing uh, both for adults and in youth in the criminal legal system and in favor instead of investing with a public health approach in community health human services that are aligned with our racial equity values. In addition, we are investing in areas where we have some of the greatest needs like unincorporated uh, parts of King County like Skyway. Also, our executive made a commitment to close the detention portion of the Children and Family Justice Center by 2025. We've actually been able to do some pretty amazing things with COVID-19 that we then have to ask, 
why can't we continue these under the banner of racial justice and racial equity? So for example, due to COVID-19 in King County, we were able to decrease the number of adults incarcerated from an average of 1,900 in a one day to 1,300, a 600 um, uh, person decrease in number of adults incarcerated in our King County jails. Now, why can't we continue to do these under the principles of race, uh, anti-racism work? As we move into recovery from the pandemic, we cannot make the same mistakes we made in 2009 with the Great Recession that systematically stripped household wealth and by association health from black and brown communities. So what's next? Uh, as public health practitioners and for us as a region, a big challenge ahead, of course, is vaccination. That's what we're all thinking about. Black, indigenous, people of color communities have been devastated locally, not just by the virus, but by social, economic, and mental health impacts. I want to point to data once again in a recent national report from the Kaiser Family Foundation that I think we have to just think about as we head into this, some of these next challenges. So the, to, the answer to the, to the question of Blacks who feel it is a bad time to be Black in America, we see a troubling rise. These are percentage of people nationally who said is a is, is, uh, bad time to be black in America. For black men from 2006, when 28% of black men said it was a bad time to be black in America. Today, or in 2020, it was 65%. For black women, we saw the increase from 15% to 59%. This is a several fold increase. Part of the survey asked about experiencing race-based discrimination in different settings and whether people had experienced this in the last 12 months, whether they've been treated unfairly based on their race. For those who had experienced race-based discrimination in the store while shopping, for, eight, for whites, it was 8%. For Latinx, it was 24%. For Blacks, it was 40%. In dealing with police, like in traffic incidences, for whites, 5%. For Latinx, 18%. For Blacks, 26%. This is now that'll be important for us in, in, in vaccination while getting healthcare for themselves or family member, 5% of whites felt uh, uh, bias or discrimination. For the Latinx population, 19%. For blacks, 20%. For black women, it's even higher at 25%. And for black mothers, 37%. So let's think about what this means when we're trying to vaccinate those who are most impacted by COVID. And also for the question of whether healthcare systems often treat people unfairly based on their race or ethnic background, 70% of Blacks answered yes, compared to 43% of the Latinx population or 41% of whites. Importantly, only 44% of Blacks and 50% of Latinx trust the healthcare system all or most of the time to do what is right for their community. So let's remember Dr. King, or Dr. Uh, Martin Luther King Day, who himself said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice and health is the most shocking and inhumane. And so to be successful in King County and nationally, we need to frame the question correctly so we have the right response to the problem. For vaccines and BIPOC communities, we often talk about Black and Indigenous communities distrusting a vaccine or the healthcare system. But we need to ask why, what is the root cause? Racism and the things that have happened. So this means for us as institutions, as public health, as a healthcare sector, as a community, as we move into vaccination, we need to really frame the question correctly. Saying trust or mistrust puts blame on the individual, something we need to fix in that individual, or in this case, our communities of color. At the end, our systems and institutions, including in public health, need to acknowledge past wrongs and work in a different way with communities. We need to invest in them, continue to invest in them, listen to them, have them be part of our institutions and answers, have them and us in positions of power and as spokespeople and break down all the ways white dominant organizations and systems have not worked for communities of color. As public health, we have our work cut out in front of us here, but what's new? At the end, I am hopeful, I truly am. Since I have seen the progress that has happened and how our actions on racial equity are beyond words, and there has been significant progress at the local national level. Dr. King also said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. That's so true, but it won't get there alone. We all are part of that solution. Thank you. 
And Dr. Valenzuela joined the equity, diversity and inclusion leaders for a Q&A session to answer questions from students and staff. And that session, along with the recording of this program and messages from our local leaders, can be found at seattlecolleges.edu forward slash MLK. SCC TV will rebroadcast the program on Saturday, January 16th at 7 p.m. and at 7 p.m. every Saturday through February 27th. Thank you all for joining us today. We hope your souls have been lifted, your spirits renewed. Please be healthy and safe and can't wait to see you next year.